I'd like to welcome everybody to the Brookfield Ag Commission's February meeting. Um, we have a short business meeting we need to take care of before our speakers take over for the evening. <coughs> we need to review the minutes. Barbara, do you want to read them since they're short? Okay. Um, meeting, I mean the minutes of the meeting of January 13th, 2016. The meeting was called to order at 6.32 by Chairman Cindy Thompson. Present were Cindy Thompson, Ken Cleveland, Barbara Haberlin, Don Haberlin, Steve Novak, Clarence Snyder, and Don Grimes. Minutes of the November 11, 2015 meeting were reviewed. There was a motion and a second to accept the minutes as presented. After no further discussion, the motion carried. Our February 10th meeting will be our Raising Chickens program with Roseanne Thibault and a discussion about avian flu with Dr. Mark Lejeune. March has been scheduled to be our family popcorn and a movie night. Comments made suggested that we move this from Wednesday night to a Friday non-school night to be determined. Clarence then introduced our guest speaker, Kate Marquis, regional state forester. Kate presented brochures and magazines <coughs> and discussed the state's chapter 61 and other programs available. Many townspeople and attendees from surrounding towns made for an informative discussion. A suggested future warmer weather program was a cordwood marking workshop. With no other business or discussion, the next meeting was scheduled for February 10th, 2016 at 6.30 p.m. It was motioned and seconded to adjourn the meeting. Respectfully submitted, Barbara Havlin. Motion to approve. Second. So we need to determine a date for our March meeting. Should we move it to the second Friday instead of the second Wednesday? And do we want to have it here? Do we have capability to, to show a movie here? I know I can do it next door. At the church? Yep. Yeah. Um, that thing's a pain in the neck to get up here, isn't it? They don't want us to put it up anymore. Really? Because of the picture. So I. Like, the date on that Friday? Mm -hmm. So you want to start doing that? I mean, I, I can do, we can do fellowship hall. Let's do that. Let's. Right. Let me, let me confirm fellowship hall is available. Okay. And then we can schedule one. Okay. And if we do that, we can do the CISA. So March too. 11th. Um, do we want to have it earlier? Same time? What do you think? Are we aiming, are we targeting younger children? Yeah, because we wanted to do the pumpkin thing too, right? Which pumpkin Where's the bill? Thing? Don't we want to do a little education on pumpkins? No, that's another meeting. That's another meeting. That's April. That's April. A April? Okay. Yeah, that's a separate, separate meeting. Um, let's stay with 6.30. Okay. Okay. Um, the other thing we need to talk about, I guess there are two things. State Ag Day, um, okay. if we have somebody who would like to go to that. Yeah, anybody want to go? Is anybody going? Yep, I'm going. And that what's 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 the date? It's fifth, April fifth. April fifth at the State House yep. in Boston. Oh, I'm going to be there at eight thirty. I'm going to get out of bed. You have to be there at eight thirty. Yeah. Oh, to get parking and stuff. Oh, yeah, parking will be train. atrocious because I got to carry stuff. Okay. I'll be there with um, basic blanket. Oh, okay. And uh, sheep Federation, so. Awesome. So, we'll, yeah, we'll be covering. Okay. And then the uh, Mass Association of Ag Commission meetings yeah, is the last Friday in February. Um, do we have a volunteer who'd like to attend? Yeah. Where is it? I want to say it's Marlboro. Oh, okay. I think it's Marlboro. It's in Marlboro, right behind the Farm Bureau. Farm Bureau. That's I can't the do that. During the daytime meeting, I think. February 26th. Yeah. Yeah, I can't do it. Ken, do you want to go? Who will? Okay. Okay. Any other business? Okay. I think we'll adjourn the business meeting um, and let Clarence introduce our speaker for the evening. Or speaker is actually. Yes. Welcome to the field and commissions. Uh, uh, educational session this evening where we'll, I'll introduce Roseanne Thibault, 
minute to talk about chickens. And just to say, I get to do my info version first. I hope you've signed up for this. Mr. Lulu, Dr. Lulu, as well. Yeah, yeah, two for both. <coughs> so anyway, just a real quick commercial that uh, you have to the end of the month to sign up for Central Mass Rome if you're interested in having uh, your farm identified within uh, that uh, uh, brochure. We've had real good luck. We had 148 uh, members join last year. We're looking to grow that over this year as well. This is something that started in Brookfield with a little trifold folder here for our IT farms. And it's kind of grown to Worcester County. So, again, anybody interested, um, you can see me or Ken Cleveland uh, to get older guys and uh, sign up. Or you can go online at Central Mass Brown and sign up there as well. So, with that, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Roseanne, who's going to give uh, us uh, an intro to raising chickens. And then she'll be followed by Mark Lanou, where we'll have an open uh, session on being employed. Thank you, again, Roseanne. Each town has, has different rules and regulations. Some will allow hens and some will allow both hens and roosters. So you need to check to make sure you know what you're allowed to do. Also, you should check with your neighbor. Let your neighbor know that you've decided to get chickens um, so that they, they're not going to be surprised when they wake up one morning and they hear a rooster crowing or the hens see hens outside. Also, you need to, when you decide to get chickens, you need to research what kind of what breed do you want and what are you, what are you going to use the chickens for? Is it for meat, uh, for eggs, uh, you, are you buying show birds? So you need to decide what you're going to use the chickens for. If you're going to buy meat birds, you need to find out where are you going to have them processed when they're ready to be uh, you know, killed and eaten. Where are you going to have them processed? A lot of your birds are both beef and eggs. And you also need to think about the type of bird too, because in New England our winters are pretty cold, so you need to have a, a winter hardy bird. So there, you really need to investigate the type of birds that you want to get. If you have a child that's going to be feeding the animals or using it as a 4-H project, you kind of need uh, a bird that isn't too flighty or that they're that they can handle easily. You don't want to get something uh, like a, a white lemon is a very flighty bird. You don't want to get something that the child will, you know, become scared of if it flies at it. Okay, so you've decided what breed you're going to get. You've ordered your, your checks. So what's that? So you actually need to get your brooder ready. Ideally, you need like a circular area to keep your, your chicks in. And you know, so there, there is like a, a cardboard a, a enclosure that you can use, or what I use is a swimming pool. The last few years we've used a swimming pool for our chicks, and that worked out well. But when you, you decide to get your chicks and you're getting your brood ready, you need to get, you know, first of all, you can start by putting down some shavings. And then you can put some newspaper down. We don't want to put the new chicks right on shavings because they're liable to eat them, and you don't want them to eat them or to lose them. Also, I found the problem with newspaper is that it can be slippery, and then the chicks, as they're walking, and if their legs split, then you get what they call a splayed leg, where the legs will split out, and then there's no way to get them back together. So I found by putting paper towels over the newspaper, it works well because it gives the chicks something to grip when they're walking. Also, you're going to need a feeder and a water. Now, you want something that you, the chick will only put the head in to get water. You don't want something, a big container, like, you know, a big container like this with the chick because they're going to climb in and they'll drown. So you want something small enough where the chick will will drink and not fall in the container. Also, for your feet, you want something like this for your feet. And then, if, I mean, if you're getting 
several chicks, more than a half a dozen or so, you might need something like this, you know, if you have a, a larger amount. Also, this is a good size water if you have a larger amount of chickens. When you first get your chicks, you, when you get your, your feed here, you can also sprinkle a little bit of feed on the floor for the chicks, and you've got your water. When you get your chicks, you, sometimes you'll have to take them and stick their beak in the water so that they'll, they'll know where the water is and they'll learn how to drink. If your chicks are coming by now, and a lot of them do, they may be kind of sluggish or if, if they come from quite a distance, they may, they may need a little boost. So you can always give them some electrolytes. Mix some electrolytes with water and for a few days to give them a little extra. But if your chicks, you find that your chicks do need some electrolytes, also put, give them a plain container of water. Because if your chicks doesn't like the water with the electrolytes, they may not drink. So if they have one container with electrolytes and one with plain water, then you know that they'll drink. If you sprinkle a, feed, a little bit of the feed on, on the ground, as well as your feeder, they'll learn to, to eat quicker. Also, when you get your chicks, you need to keep them warm. So you can use a, a lamp like this to keep them warm. And they're with a bulb like this. Both of these bulbs are 250 watt. But the better bulb is the one with the, the red bulb. Both of them will keep them warm, but the red bulb, because it's red, it kind of keeps the chick quiet. It'll keep the chicks quieter. Uh, also, if you have a chick that may have a little bit of spotted blood or something on them, everything looks red, so the other chicks won't go, go after it and stop pecking at it. So you're better off with the bulb that has the, the red bulb. <coughs> your your line over the chicks should be about 18 inches. So you want the, from, the, from the floor of your brooder to the light, you want it about 18 inches. You want, you want the temperature in the air between 90 and 95 degrees when you, when you first get your chicks. And every week after that, you can decrease it by five degrees until the temperature inside is the same as the temperature outside, and you can just continue your love. And also when the chickens have feathered out. But the thing is, just because you have your light, you still have to watch the chicks. If you see that the chicks are up against the wall of your, your brooder, they're probably too warm. And you may have to you know, raise the light. If you see that they're all huddling in the middle underneath the light, they may be too cold and you may have to lower the light. So you really have to take your cues from what the chicks are doing. So for the first eight weeks, your chicks 
around chick stop from the eight weeks to the stop to lay, you're, they're on a row of feet. Now there's different types of feet. This, I mean, this mash, which is like a powdery feet, this crumbles, and this layer cuts. And whichever one you feed, the, the feet, the food is all the same. They're just different because the way it's, it's made. So it's up to you. Whichever is more convenient for you is the best way to feed it. When you move your, chick, your chicks into the permanent location, you want to make sure that you have plenty of, of bedding on the floor. We, use, we like shade. I always use we always use shavings. That seems to be the best type of bedding. You can use other like straw and hay and all that, but the best, really the best is shavings because it's easier to work with and it fits good. And but you want to use a pine shade. You don't want to use anything else other than a pine shade. So when you're moving your chickens into their permanent location, you're going to have a larger, you know, water or a larger feeder. So you're using a larger feeder and a larger water. For a couple days, it's always a good idea to put in the water and the feeder that they've been used to. That way, they, when they go in, they, and all the new feeder and water is going to be strange to them. They'll still have, the, you know, your water that they were used to. That way they're not going to stop eating or drinking. You want to make sure that they always have fresh water and food in front of them. Um, you don't want them to go without food and you don't want them to go without water. Also when you, when you put them in a permanent, permanent location, the birds need, the chickens need a roost like a two by two board that the, the chickens can uh, roost on at night. And they do, they roost up on, on the boards at night. Uh, you could even use a tree branch. Things you don't want to use uh, pipe, piping, uh, the metal pipe. You don't want to use anything like that. You want to use either a two by two or you could use a tree branch. Okay. And you don't want it too big. Use two by two because when the chicks roost at night, they're holding on to the, the roost. And in the winter, when it's cold, their, their breast feathers will cover their feet and keep their feet warm so that their feet aren't going to freeze in the winter. Okay, so, so your birds now are about five, six months old. They're getting ready to lay. So how can you tell they're getting ready to lay? Okay, the, the combs are kind of red. You know, the combs will get red when they get ready to lay. Um, so you can go from a grower feed to a layer feed. A layer has uh, 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 calcium in it to help with the eggshells. But when your birds are starting to lay, they also need oyster shells. You need oyster shells for them because it gives them more calcium to them. For the first year or so, the eggs the shells are nice and hard when the chickens stop laying. But after a year or so, it's time to get soft. So you need the oyster shells to help keep that shell high. Also, if you're just feeding a commercial feed, you don't need grit. But if you're giving your birds, uh, you know, vegetables and lettuce and corn or any other things, they need grit. Grit helps them break. They have no teeth, but so the grit helps them break down their food. So if you get if you're anything other than commercial feed, they do need grit. And there's different size grits. This is a small one, and this is like a layer grit. So there's different size grits depending on the size of your birds. Okay. Also, you can give scratch feed. Uh, scratch feed, like, they call it scratch because you can throw the feed on the ground. And the chickens will kind of scratch in the, in the bedding. And that way it also helps to aerate the bedding and keep it dry. The scratch pea has coarse crack corn wheat oats in it. Okay, your, your birds are getting ready to lay, so now you need to put some nest in, in, the, in your barn. Okay, this is like a typical nest. They're about 14 by 12 inches wide, and it all depends on the type of bird. If you have, if you have a real big 
a big bird, you may need a little larger. If a small, like a banty, you may need a small one. But the important thing with, with the nest is that you want a slanted top. That way, your birds aren't going to roost up here and mess all over your nest. Also, your nest, you need a board in the front so that your birds can jump up onto the board and then walk into the nest. If you don't have this board here, they're not going to go in here. Uh, also, your nest, you want to keep your nest nice and clean with shavings. Okay. You keep your nest full with shavings because they'll keep the eggs nice and clean. And as you go, go in the barn and you're collecting your eggs and you're just going in to feed your birds, it's a good idea just to peek at the nest because some of the chickens will sleep in here or they may mess in the nest. So if you see that they mess in the nest, just take it out. Keep it out. Take it out. Also, you want to keep your nest full of shavings so that your air eggs are going to be nice and clean. If, if you pick up your eggs and you see that you know, maybe there's, there's a little spot on your eggs, you can always clean it with a little steel wool. And there are all kinds of things you can buy to clean the eggs with, but we've always used the fine steel wool, and that works. Um, another problem that you may see when your chicken stop laying is what we call an egg eater, a chicken that will come in and break the egg and eat the egg. There's no way to break them with it. You can, you can do things like pick up the eggs more frequently, but the best thing is to take the chicken out and eat because they're not going to stop breaking the eggs and eating the eggs. Also, uh, when you're picking up your eggs, it's a good idea to count your eggs and record them. Record them on a calendar or something. That way you know how your, egg, your, egg, your birds are producing. Because that way you know if there's something wrong, if the egg production goes down, then you know there might be something wrong. Egg production will go down in the winter because there's not enough light. The, the birds need like a 14 to 16 hours of light to, for optimal egg production. And in the winter, we don't have that. So you will notice in the winter that your egg production goes down. You can fix that by uh, adding lights, putting lights in. You know, to make up for the 14 or 16 hours that we lose. Um, but that's, you know, your discretion. When you're putting your nest box in, you want to make sure that the nest box is like about 24 inches off the ground. Because you don't want to put the nest on the ground, you want them up on the ground. The chickens like to be up. And you want to put it in a quiet area. Maybe a kind of a dark pond or a quiet pond where there's not a lot of commotion. You want to keep, you know, your your, your barn kind of quiet. The more the more stress the birds are under, the less egg production you will have. Once you pick up your eggs, you want to refrigerate them. And eggs are eggs are porous, so you want to make sure that when you pick up your eggs, that you refrigerate them. If you, you find your, your birds are outside free ranging and you find that they're laying, you don't you find egg, you find a pile of eggs outside and you don't know are they fresh or are they not fresh. What you can always do is they call it it's a water test, a float test. You take a container of water and you can put your egg in it. If the egg lies flat on the bottom, it's fresh. As it gets older, like a week or so older, it'll come up on its on its end, and then two or three weeks it's up straight, and if it's floating at the top, you throw it away. It's, it's no good. Okay, we want to keep our uh, barn nice and, and quiet and serene. Uh, another problem you may get with the chickens is they'll stop hanging at each other, especially if you see a chicken that maybe has a little blood spot or something. Sometimes they'll stop hanging at each other. There is this is what they call a rooster booster that you can put on the birds so that the other birds won't pack at them. You need, the birds need plenty of room to roam. You know, if you, if, so you don't want your barn crowd. They need plenty of room where they can roam. Uh, also, they need, you need to have enough feeders and waters in your chicken coop. Um, 
they should all be able to drink and eat about the same time. You want to make sure that your water and your feeder are no more than 10 feet apart. Another that's stress busters, don't mix birds. If, you, if somebody says to you, oh, I've got a couple birds, you want them? If you take them and you put them in with your flock, then you're, you're, you're going to have some fighting because that your birds are not going to tolerate the new bird coming in. Also, it's kind of dangerous because of diseases. Another thing, don't let the kids or dogs chase your birds. Okay? You don't want them to chase your birds. Um, because they may, if, if they're chasing them, it's not a bad habit that the chickens have. They frighten her easy and they head for a corner. And if they head for a corner, they may suffocate. They may crowd and suffocate. And they suffocate very fast. It's just a matter of seconds. You can lose a lot of the flock if they go to a corner and suffocate. So don't let, try to keep it quiet. And don't let the kids and, the, and dogs chase them. Also, some of the predators that we have to be careful for are like hawks, owls, eagles, bears, foxes, coyotes, bobcats, raccoons, possums, weasels, fisher cats. So at night, you want to make sure that you secure your barn door. Lock your birds up at night so they're not there. No predator is going to get in. Also, if you're putting a fence around the area, you, depending on the type of fencing you're using, you, if you want to put your fence down below the ground so that the animals aren't going to be able to dig underneath the fence and get in to get at your animals. Okay, so, so what do we do in hot weather? Okay, in hot weather, your birds will eat less. You need to provide a lot of, like, plenty of fresh water for them. Your birds need, like, trees or shrubs or a place where they can go and, and be cool. And you'll notice your birds will be digging holes and they'll be, like, laying in holes in your yard. That's, that's one way of cooling themselves off. It's one way of cleaning themselves, but it's also a way of cooling themselves off. Um, if the temperature reaches 95 degrees, you're going to stop losing your birds. They can't tolerate the heat. The birds can tolerate the cold better than they can tolerate the heat. Your temperature's up to 95, watch your birds. You'll notice your birds will be panting and they look ill. It's because of the heat. Okay, in the cold weather, they eat more in the cold weather to stay warm, uh, to give them the additional energy. One thing with, with the cold, this year hasn't been too, too bad. No, it's bad as the cold hasn't been as bad as last year. One of the things with some of your birds, like your dad and birds, have a nice big comb. If it's too cold, sometimes the combs will freeze, and your combs will turn and turn black if they, if they freeze. So try to keep your birds away from drafts. Um, keep them in an area where they're warm. And if you don't need to put heat, if you, know, if you have a good amount of bedding and your barn is free of drafts, they should be able to tolerate the winter weather. They can tolerate the cold weather because they fluff up their feathers and hold the air in, and they'll keep them warm. Um, okay, now chickens can live up to a dozen years or more. Uh, so you want to protect your, your birds from infections. Or, so when you're buying chicks and you're buying your birds, make sure you're getting them from a healthy stock, you want healthy, healthy birds. You want to feed them a balanced recreation, and you want to give them plenty of fresh water. And they should have food and water in front of them at all times. They need a dry, well-ventilated shelter. So you, you, the coop should be dry and well-ventilated. If you walk in and you smell ammonia, that's a danger sign. There's something wrong. Usually it's ventilation. Usually it's ventilation. Um, if your floor gets wet, like they tip over the water, or your floor gets wet, uh, you should clean it up, clean it up. You don't need to clean the barn except in, once a year, like in the early spring, unless your floors get wet. But in the early spring, it's a good idea to clean everything up and wash everything and give everything a fresh shot. If you walk into your barn and you find a dead bird or something, just take it out. You, you may lose some, but just take it out, take it out. Um, Another thing to protect your bird, you want to keep your chickens away from other chickens. What happens is at Easter time, <coughs> you get chicks for Easter because they're cute. A month or so after that, you start getting a call. I've got a chicken, 
do you want? Say no. You don't want to bring any chickens into your flock. Because you don't know, your birds may look healthy, their birds may look healthy, and you put them together and one of them may have something wrong. So don't, don't bring any chickens in. You want to keep away from other people's poultry. You, you don't let anybody that has poultry go into your, your poultry. Keep people away. Um, you should have like separate barn shoes and separate and, and clothing that you're wearing just in your barn. Um, not, not to go to, to the neighbors or to go to fairs. Uh, what, one thing I know, kids, kids always want to go to the fairs and see all the chickens, but they should not wear their barn shoes or their barn clothes to go see other people's chickens. If you have chicks and chickens, take, take care of the chicks first before you take care of the older, the older birds. Are any questions? How long ago did you start farming? How, have I started farming? How long ago did you start people? Uh, uh, my grandparents bought the farm in 1925. She knows something about chickens. That's <laughs> us. Survival food. And my father always had chickens, and he also had a hatchery. Hatchery. Yeah. How many weeks now you say that you've got to put something down on the, the uh, shavings when you put them in their young, and you're afraid that they'll eat it? Right, that's oh. why we cover the shavings, because you're, get, you're getting a day old bird that knows nothing. So if, if you just put them on the shavings, they're liable to eat that. So if you put newspaper and put paper over it. Give them a few days so they know what the food is, you know, and you know, then they should be fine after a while. Do you have to have a, a, a farm number for chickens? You know, do you know what I'm talking about? No. Like my sheep, if, if, all my sheep, is, it, it starts off with MA38, all right? And then it goes one to whatever number you want to come up to. Do you have to do that with chickens at all? Not that I'm aware of. I've never heard of it, no. no. If you want to keep track of your chickens as to how they're doing and stuff like that, would you would you go to some kind of a, a, a leg wrap or something that will go on your legs there's, so you know who they are? There's bands. There's leg they're bands. bands. There are different colored leg bands that you can put on your chickens. Yeah. But, so this one here, if you've got somebody that's acting out, eating your bird, eating your chicken, eating, uh, eating the egg, something yeah. like that. But you can tell, usually the egg is just egg yolk on pizza. Well, I haven't been successful with that. <laughs> you know, you can pick the eggs up more frequently, but once they get the taste of the egg, they, they just keep going back and breaking the Yes, I know. <laughs> so they're better off to eat the bird. Do you, do you, you don't sell chicks for you, right? Do you? Chicks? Yes. You do? Yeah, but I don't get them until after Easter. Do you, like if I put in an order for say 10 or 12 black ass blocks, the large ones, not the fancy sized, can I get them through you? Uh, yeah, if we're, yeah, if, if, we're, if we're going to order them from past them again. Yeah. Because you know, where I go, I go to Hardwick, and I always end up with the fancy fancy size, and that's not so swell. I don't want them. Okay. You would have to look at the catalog and see what they have. Yeah. I mean, they've only got a short list of about 10 different breeds that they're buying this year, and the, less than that, the Astrolops aren't in. You know, and I, I got a thing for them. For whatever reason I do, I like them. Yeah. I look through the catalog and see what they have. Yeah. Do you have catalogs from where you are, or do I have to go to a supplier? Uh, this weekend I'm supposed to get the catalog that we're going to buy from. All right. I just a couple other people that want to buy I was going through one uh, company last year, but I'm going to change this year. Bobby's elbow's late. What do you see? 
So with that, I want to thank Rosanna for coming another year, and uh, we'll, we'll see if we get more than 87 views for this time around. But again, if you have questions about chickens and the like, it's uh, Timo Paul's Road, on Route 31, just north of Spencer Center, and Rosanna has been very, very good to, I went to answer to questions. And to get that. So again, Rosanna, thank you for coming.
but if it's start to see a pattern and maybe you have two, three, four birds dying suddenly, it's time to get them tested. And the testing really doesn't cost you anything because it's, 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 it'll be done by the federal government. It's just a matter of making the connection either with, with a local veterinarian or the Department of Animal Health in Boston. They get in uh, touch with veterinary services which work right out of Sutton. And they'd send somebody out to, you know, take the birds and get them to a lab and get them tested. There's also the other ways that there's, a, there's always a surveillance, because I think, I think Don was asking about like, the birds, like, like the scrapey program and sheep. Uh, what happens with the birds is that if you send the birds to a, uh, through a regular auction market, like your crate is marked by the, by the uh, cattle dealer or whoever brings them in there, and then it's sporadic, but there just might be somebody there that's going to take a blood sample from your bird and test it for avian influenza. In a lot, in, in other diseases, all also that's how they keep a surveillance. Also, show birds are sporadically tested for it, which um, I guess brings up. Let me see if I'm going. In. Yeah, and then I, I guess I'll go on to like the human side of things. Can you can you catch it from from the birds? If your birds had it, yes, you can. I mean, you can you can develop flu-like symptoms, but it's not very common. Those large outbreaks, like in the Midwest, the people that would come down with a, a form of flu are the people that are really closely in contact with the birds, with their litter, with their nasal discharges. They're the ones that be more likely to come down with it, and that's not to say that they're going to pass it to another human because they're probably not. The bird flu that we hear about, like that they have in China, where you see all the Chinese people going around masks on, that's actually a mutated form of the bird flu. It's not the, it's not, so to speak, the actual flu that the bird had. The, after a while, the virus, because the bird flu is actually a virus. The virus changes so it's a lot more adaptable to humans. A lot of these diseases of animals, they, you know, many of them don't really want to live in humans unless they're somehow modified. Then they're a lot more happier to live in a human being. So that, that's how those, like, those big outbreaks in China and in humans happen. It started out in a, in a chicken or whatever, but you know, through mutations of the virus, then it's a little, like, kind of like humans better, so. Then, uh, oh yeah, and people that come down with the bird flu, like when they go, in these outbreaks out west, like I said, they're, they're really people that have been right in there with the heavily contaminated material, so, like the best thing in your off flock is kind of, it's, it's really not good kind of to, you know, be like nose to nose with a chicken or in close, in close proximity face to face. I mean, it's fine to pick them up and everybody likes to do that with their chickens, but um, it's probably good public health precaution just not to, uh, you know, get face to face with them. Also, as Roseanne was saying, it, it's a good uh, biosecurity uh, practice not to go to fairs and come back with the same boots and walk in the coop. Or um, it'd be more of a problem like if you were getting already late bullets from some place and all of a sudden you're stuck in with your own birds. That could be more of a problem. I think you're fairly, it'd be fairly unlikely to get gay old chicks and end up with avian influenza. Not that it's impossible, but I think it would be a lot less likely than if you got uh, pullets that are ready to lay. You know, all the same things about washing your hands and cleanliness, those all pertain to, you know, not, not getting it yourself or transferring it to the, uh, to your chickens. But like I said, it's, it's, it would, it's very, it would be very unlikely for you to actually get it from a chicken. I mean, it's, or turkeys or whatever. It's almost seen more, a little bit more in turkeys than it is in chickens now. Oh yeah, then you might ask, well, can I get it from poultry products like eggs or eating, eating meat, even if the birds and 
Dr. Not if you, not if your poultry products are cooked properly. They, the government actually re re uh, recommends not really eating like a sunny side up egg or whatever. They actually say the egg should be totally cooked through. You want to be on the safe side. And same with your meat. You don't want to eat the raw meats, or partially cooked meats. Your pets can also get uh, avian influenza. There's been instances like with cats that uh, catch a wild bird that's been infected with it and come down with avian influenza. But the, these things are fairly rare. Pretty sure I went through all of the. Uh... Oh, and so what happens if there is an outbreak? And that would that would probably happen here. The, the uh, United States Department of Agriculture, they really like to come right in and in, in, uh, in, uh, euthanize all the birds immediately. That's how we handle it. There, there, there has been vaccines uh, uh, developed over the years to prevent it to some extent, but they're really not used. It's just a, it's just a kill type of uh, practice. That's what they did. Because you probably know that there's quite a bit of a problem up in the Midwest this year. So as, as soon as your flock was um, determined to have it, even if the birds didn't look all that sick, they just come in and, and kill them all and dispose of them. Yeah, and the other thing you should do if you see, if you would all of a sudden see like a lot of dead ducks or geese or whatever on your property, you definitely want to get a hold of either a veterinarian locally or state veterinarian or uh, the Department of Fish and Wildlife and report that. Um, like I said, it's it would be sort of odd for that to happen because usually the birds are actually mainly carriers, but they but they can die too from. And I guess that's the last thing I want to mention. If, same with your chickens. I mean, if you, if you see any pattern in deaths in your coop, then it's worthwhile reporting it. I mean, the, the, the cases that I get called into with poultry many times, many times they involve management problems. That's what I usually see. And people, they'll lose a few birds or whatever, and usually I can say, well, you know, feed them quite right, or you know, housing them right. And occasionally I'll see some uh, actual disease entity, but it's usually bad management. And you'd be surprised how many people's coops you see that, like this time of the year, they get a few birds and they're all wet and the snow's all blown in there and uh, they don't get fed properly. Probably quite a bit of that. Uh, any questions? So have we seen anything this year, Mark? Well, it's yes. actually in, 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 in New England, New York, and I think actually, I think it really the closest probably was like Indiana. And uh, we really haven't had anything here as far as uh, avian flying. So the only real thing is like Canadian geese or something like yeah, that? The, yeah, Canadian geese, ducks. From what I read, like I, I assume the you know blue herons can carry it. Songbirds a little less likely actually, but you know they can carry it. Any any, any fowl can carry it. You know. Like I said, I think we're sort of fortunate because we're not really in a major flyway. It's pretty Actually, if you go more towards Boston, like when I go over to Sterling, for instance, you'll see a lot more geese flying in Sterling than you will in Brookfield. Actually, <laughs> they're getting closer to the flyway. Any other questions for Mark today? Must be the high taxes that don't want to come to see. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's something I guess I guess it's something like I say, at this point in central Massachusetts, I kind of say it's something to continue monitoring, but it's sort of like not a real big deal right here in central Massachusetts. Could it become a big deal? Yeah, maybe. Like anything else, there's always a chance that it could, sure. could show up. But again. I want to thank Mark again for coming today. Thank you. Stop
farm and uh, take advantage of all the fresh food products yep. up there. So again, thank you, and uh, uh, yeah. I'd say good evening yeah. for the Brookfield Egg Commission. That's so better than an egg. So what's the other perfect oh. food besides the egg? Anybody not? Mother's oh. Gotta be sick. Mother's milk. Really? He's right. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. What did you say? Mother's milk. So oh. Paul and I always used to ask you that question with Dr. Grover, the poultry man at UMass, 40 years ago. That was his beginning question. <laughs> I probably heard it 16 years ago. <laughs> again, and with that, then, uh, again, I want to thank Mark and Roseanne for show, coming tonight and getting uh, some, uh, giving us some additional information. And again, look forward to seeing you on uh, Brookfield Community Media or on YouTube. And uh, be safe. Thanks very much.